tomorrow's lecture, uh, that's supposed to be the community. I'll be doing that one. So she comes next to me. Now, if any of you have found the book today, if I finish this, I see this is that I want to take my time to explain it a lot. I will only be left with the uh, six slides. And that will be for the running and the system. system. I don't want you to drive yourself there because of six slides. So I, I intend to do it online. Is that okay with you? That's mm -hmm. good. All right, so you don't have to come in 8 o'clock tomorrow. I will do it online just for those six slides. But if for any reason I'm able to cover that, I don't want to. I don't want to rush it. So we don't do the six slides. It shouldn't take me 20 minutes for tomorrow. Okay. You're recording it all right tomorrow right? You want me to record it? Yeah, just record no, it. I'll record it. Okay, yeah, I understand. So. Yeah, you can just record it and post it. And that'll be fine with you? Yeah. <laughs> if we have questions, we can just email you. Okay. Right. And no, trust me, you won't have questions because it's still full. Oh, okay. So if That's that is the case, mm -hmm. then today will be my last lecture. So next week, you can use that to do your uh, to prep for your exam. Yes. Would it be like the same stuff you have when like, we're back in like the class of physiology when we're talking about the rats and going on how it goes from occupants in one? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why I left it and that's where we started. <coughs> so I'll just do that. So it's possible for me to even record lectures today and then post. So mm -hmm. if you have lectures, uh, if you have uh, questions, yeah, that'd be, that'd be good one. Let's do that. Okay, and that'll be good. Then so, we'll see you January 18th. Oh, so this is your last week, and then we have Milton, and that will be it? Yeah, yeah for me, mm -hmm. today will be my last physical right. oh, interaction with you. And next one, specifically January 18th. 8 o'clock. Same place, same, same person. No, not same place. <laughs> same place. Same, same person, same time. But it's going to be in Grey Hall. Grey? Yes. Oh. So, I'll be there. But I have a Thank question. you very much, Dad. Mm -hmm. um, so, will it be over She has questions about the finals. Yeah. Listen now, listen now, listen. The final, will it just be this material going forward or will it just be everything, even if we'll be testing over today? Uh, oh, no, the last, oh, no, the finals will be comprehensive. Over everything. So, it will be everything I covered. Okay, okay cool. Uh, whatever Dr. Milton and I covered. On the renal yeah, system, that's so that's everything. So everything is comprehensive? Yeah. Not just Friday, all the way up until when we end it? No, we're in it. We're in it. It did Friday. It did the other Friday, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever it is, whatever I came to teach, yeah. since I came in, mm -hmm. that's the meaning of comprehensive. Oh, okay. okay so everything. And just everything I touch. Yeah, you do? It looks good. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll remember you in my exam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today I was starting with acid base disorder. And uh, this has to do a lot with the kidney. And I know many of you just struggled to understand kidney when it was done. So this is the time it will come to bite you. So I'll try and do some review for you to put certain things in perspective, at least to just help your understanding. Because the kidneys is one of those organs that regulates the, that contributes to the buffer system of the body, such that when there's too much of acid in the body, the kidney adjusts. When there's too much of base, the kidney adjusts. When there's too much of electrolytes, the kidney adjusts. So let's see what we're. So typically, when you have a disorder of the alpha acid base, you can have too much of acid, or you can have too much of the base. If you have too much of acid, then you say the individual has acidosis. And if the individual has too little of it, or too much of bicarbonate, then that is alkalosis. Okay? Too little acid, too much of bicarbonate, that's alkalosis. The bicarbonate will tie to alkaline environment, 
the acidosis will be related to the acid or the hydrogen ion. <coughs> Let's take that one. <coughs> and there will be two types of that situation. You can have metabolic acidosis, or you can have respiratory acidosis. Mm. And you can also have metabolic alkalosis, as well as respiratory alkalosis. And I'll tell you what will determine one versus the other. So in this case, and I'll be referring to it from time to time, we see somebody with the acidosis. The type here is metabolic not respiratory. Okay. Now, what happened in this case, I uh, went to the, he was in a semi, semi comatose state. I've underlined the key word that will point to acidosis. There was a history of alcohol abuse. The fasting blood glucose of the individual is high. It's 150 as opposed to the normal rate. And the bicarbonate is less. For example, the normal is between 20 to 26. The bicarbonate is less here, and that's where it is acidosis. Now, this important concept, this PaCO2, has the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is what you use to determine the effectiveness of ventilation. So when you look here, and this is related to, uh, so when you have the normal being 35 to 45, this is much less. Um, funny enough, it's an indication of the hydrogen or the acid, so it's an indication of the acid. This is where the equation gets a little weary, so and I want you to just note that. Though the bicarbonate, typically you think the carbon dioxide is related to the bicarbonate, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, bicarbonate measures the alkal alkalinity of the serum, whereas PaCO2 measures the acidity. The acidity. So, um, we'll, we'll get back to this. I'll come back to it. So, acid base balance must be highly controlled. And this is because you need to protect the body proteins from too much of metabolism or too little of it. The normal acid base balance gives you an extracellular pH of between 7.35 to 7.45. Anytime it is less than this, then you have acidosis. When it's greater than this, you have alkalosis. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, yeah. Anytime you have less than this value, you have less than 7.35, then you have acidosis. And if you have greater than this, you have alkalosis. Is that clear? Okay. Well, the intracellular pH is between 7 and 7.3. So how does this narrow range, and this is very narrow, this is very narrow. And let me see in this case, uh, the case we looked at, uh, where the pH, okay, look at the pH, 7.16. Hmm? Acidosis, good. All right. So to maintain this uh, balance within this narrow range, what are the uh, buffer systems and what do they do? One, that the ventilation. The ventilation is to expel carbon dioxide. Okay? To expel carbon dioxide. And you know that you will expel carbon dioxide when there is too much of the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can also cause renal excretion of acids and reabsorption of bicarbonate. So this is where I want to explain a little. Bit. So if you're looking at the nephron,
at this figure, something like this. Okay. This is the glomerulus, right? Mm -hmm. This is the plasma tube. Mm -hmm. This is the loop of Henley, right? Mm -hmm. This is the distal convoluted table. This is the collecting duct. Mm -hmm. Okay. When all the sodium, the major anions and cations, or the major electrolytes that are excreted here, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, then of course you have all that going through here. When all of them go through here, I told you, 99% of what is filtered here is what is reabsorbed, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have to reabsorb, that means, like it says here, reabsorption of bicarbonate. We mean this bicarbonate that finds itself inside the tube, mm -hmm. inside the left one, will be reabsorbed back into the system. Mm -hmm. That's reabsorption. Okay. Somewhere along the line, you find that the acids are secreted. Acids are secreted into the lumen, into this tubular lumen. And secretion will refer to something like this. So this will be the line the hydrogen ion is being secreted. This is secretion. This is the of course, sodium is also usually reabsorbed, just like bicarbonate. Potassium can be reabsorbed, potassium can be secreted. When we get to that, I'll tell you. So, but when you now have to control this narrow range in order to avoid the disorder, the kidneys have to secrete acids in order to compress it for it or reabsorb the bicarbonate so that it's adjusting that pH between the acid and the alkaline status. Okay? And of course, ventilation in this case, you're expelling carbon dioxide. And when you're expelling carbon dioxide, you are in, the, in, the, in effect excreting acid. So, when you have severe disorder, let's say this thing now goes wacko, what can happen? It can affect multiple organ systems. It's almost like nephrotic syndrome. Mm -hmm. You remember this diagram I gave you on nephrotic syndrome? It affects virtually every organ of the body. Mm -hmm. Right? The same happens when you have acid-based disorder. Because there's no tissue, there's no organ that does not need an adequate pH system in order to function normally. So it can affect the cardiovascular system, in which case there will be impaired contractility. If there is impaired contractility of the heart, I want you to refer to something I've taught you before. What then happens? Impaired contractility of the heart, what happens? Decrease volume. Decrease in what? Decrease, Decrease in cardiac output. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then when there's decrease in cardiac output, what disease condition can you get when there's decreased myocardial contractility? Future. You can have heart failure. Mm -hmm. You can have heart failure, okay? And of course, you can have arrhythmia. When the heart is not contracted normally, of course, you have arrhythmia. Then you can have issues with the pulmonary system because there will be impaired oxygen delivery, there will be respiratory fatigue, there will be dyspnea. In what condition do you have dyspnea? Mm -hmm. Okay, you have pulmonary issues, and that is in a, is that in a right heart failure or left heart failure? Left heart failure. Yeah. Left heart failure. Okay, all right. Then you can have in the kidney, you can have hypokalemia, you can have hyperkalemia. I will see that. And you can have nephrodiasis. Nephrodiasis is the deposition of kidney stones, right? Mm -hmm. And I told you, I think it was in this class I mentioned the solubility issue when you have acid crystals. Mm -hmm. In order to treat it, you have to use the principle of solubility. 
acid base, acid base. There's an acid crystal, then you alkalinize the urine. If there's an alkali crystal, you acidify the urine in order to expel it. Okay. And of course, when you have CNS, there will be a reduction in a cerebral blood flow. There will be seizures. There will be seizures. There will be coma. So if you look at this man's case, just for you to relate to it, uh, he has he was in the semi-comatose state. Mm. That is when the CNS is being affected. All right. So in this case, typically you assess the acid-base balance in the body. It's part of the routine uh, annual checkup. When the blood is withdrawn, you do what you call ABG, acid-base. Uh, what's that G again? I remember the five of So when it is measured, you measure arterial pH. We measure arterial carbon dioxide tension. This is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And this is the one I tell you relates to the acid thing that determines the acid content of the body. And then you have the serum bicarbonate, which is the one that determines the base. So if you go back here, we know that bicarbonate is real blood. I don't deny it's secreted and that you are relating to changes that not bring this about. The bicarbonate is related to the base, the PaCO2 is related to the acid. So if you have less than 7.5, it's acidosis. If it's more than 7.5, it's alkalosis. So when you have a respiratory disorder, it might be that there's an inappropriate increase or decrease in the acid. And when you have a metabolic disorder, you have an inappropriate increase or decrease in serum bicarbonate. So the metabolic one is related to bicarbonate. The metabolic one is related to bicarbonate. The respiratory one is related to what? PaCO2. Got me? Mm -hmm. you sure? I'm going slow because I don't want it to you have too many questions that will be coming from this section. And I don't want you to be thrown off. And let me tell you, you have eight questions to the exam in this. And you will need a good understanding of it, even no matter how straightforward I want to make the question. You will need to have a good understanding in order to, for you to even be there. So it's not something you should depend on memorizing. Like, that's why I'm taking my time. Are you saying eight questions so we don't have to base? Yeah. Okay. Acid base are the electrolyte on the one of the one that follows. Okay. So when it's a respiratory disorder, please know that we're talking of arterial tension of carbon dioxide. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And if it is metabolic, we are dealing with uh, the serum one. Okay. Now so um, to maintain the balance of the uh, the acid base balance, there are the buffer systems. But there's, there are intracellular buffer systems. There are extracellular buffer systems. The extracellular one, there's a primary one. That's one. The primary one is the ratio of the bicarbonate to carbon dioxide. The ratio of this to this is the primary buffer system. But where are the others? You have serum proteins can be um, uh, a buffer system, inorganic phosphate. Then for the intracellular buffers, you have hemoglobin. You have proteins. You have phosphate. All of these provide significant buffering systems. Mm -hmm. Now, let me test your understanding. The primary extracellular buffer involved in the maintenance of Acid base balance is what? Is it one, two, or three? Or one and two, or two or three? One. One, one right? Everybody agree with me? One? Yes. Okay, all right, that's one. So, 
when you want to evaluate ABG sodas, I told you, you have to measure certain things. So the ABG, or separating to the other side, is actually arterial blood gas. So typically, you measure it. You know, many of you don't go for, and you don't need to go for annual checkup. You have not reached that stage yet. Mm -hmm. But every year, I do an ABG to check whether. So these are the things you find being measured. So that they will tell of the abnormalities in the pH, the PCA2, and this. And then, this is important now, even when you have acidosis or alkalosis, whether metabolic or respiratory, there are compensatory mechanisms that are mounted by the body. And you are used now to, there are always compensatory mechanisms to try to control for things. So let me talk about the compensatory anomalies that can happen when you have either uh, metabolic acidosis or metabolic uh, alkalosis or vice versa. And that will take me to this slide. This is the right place to determine it now. For example, when you have metabolic acidosis, the arterial pH is low. That's now. What is the primary change in metabolic? Metabolic is bicarbonate, right? Hmm? You remember, the metabolic is bicarbonate, the respiratory is PaCO2. Are my students with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, dude, are you with me? They're good guys sometimes. Mm. <laughs> All right. So that is the bicarbonate. And there, there's somebody I'm missing to this one. Why is she back there? Oh, ah, she's here. Always. Always. Yeah, but normally sit here. Switch. The switch is on. Okay. Does he have to do with any compensation? No. <laughs> All right, so when you have metabolic acidosis, we are clear on this. We are clear on this. Because I need you to be clear on this before I can move faster on this. But what will be the compensatory change is that there will not be a reduction in arterial carbon dioxide content. When the arterial carbon dioxide content is reduced, that means you are compensating for the acidosis. When you have respiratory acidosis, the arterial pH is less, but we are talking of arterial pressure of carbon dioxide. Am I clear? That's what makes it respiratory as opposed to metabolic, which is bicarbonate. So in this case, it is the bicarbonate that will compensate for it. When you get to metabolic alkalosis, metabolic, bicarbonate, the pH is up, the bicarbonate is up. And in this case too, the PaCO2 will be up to compensate for it and down the line. Try to understand it. But in case you're one of those ones who are as lazy as I can be sometimes. <laughs> Just look at the arrows. Down, down, <laughs> down, down. <laughs> down, up, 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 up. <laughs> okay, all right, now. Yeah. So with this, I can go a little faster. Do we have to take notes of the remarks on the side? Or just remember down there. No, no, I'm coming, I'm coming oh. to that. I just want you to understand the compensatory things that make up for it. Okay. So when you've changed, when you have determined the primary abnormality, whether it's respiratory or uh, whether it's uh, alkalosis or respiratory alkalosis or the other ones, you have to find out what is the compensatory one. That's a concept. You call it anion gap. And I think Dr. Abobo will teach you how to calculate ion and ion gap of one of them. But for now, please know that the normal anion gap, and what do we mean by anion? 
there are alliance here, right? And there are cation. When you have a gap between the two, you measure the difference between the two. Any difference is refers to the gap. That's all. Anion gap. The anion is usually in excess of the cations. So that's why it's referred to as anion gap. So in this case, the usual value is 20 by some calculation. I didn't want to bore you, that's why I blotted it up. Just know that the anion gap, the normal value is 20. If it's, le if it's more than that, then you have metabolic acidosis. And uh, this explains more the anion gap, which is the concentration of the unmeasured cations and anions in excess of the concentration of unmeasured uh, cations in the uh, extracellular fluid. And I said, when you subtract uh, the anions from the cations, that gives you anion gap. Most labs only measure portions of this ion. That is, they measure, they measure the sodium, the chloride, the bicarbonate, and we leave so many other ions that are not measured. And that's why you talk about the unmeasured ones. So when you now measure an ion gap, typically it's now the major ones. The difference between the sodium chloride and bicarbonate. These are the anions and this is the cation. And this is what will give you the anion gap. So that's all I'm going to talk about. So moving on from there, let's talk of metabolic acidosis. If you lose bicarbonate from the body, you're losing base, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're losing base, body can only be acidotic, acidotic, clear? Mm -hmm. Okay? Or if the uh, excretion of acid by the kidney is less, that means much more acid is being retained in the body. Am I clear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I need you to be with me with that. All right. If you're losing too much of bicarbonate, you are losing alkali. Mm -hmm. You end up with acidosis. If the body is not excreting the acids as it should be, where is the acid staying? Mm -hmm. That is how you get the acidosis. The other one is this. The body produces so many acids. So if the body produces too much of endogenous acid, does that make sense that that is your acidosis, right? Mm, 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 mm. Okay. So there are two categories of metabolic acidosis. There are those ones that have normal anion gap, that is the one where the value is 20, or the one that has an increased anion gap, which is more than 20. So you can have metabolic acidosis with a normal, uh, with a normal ion, uh, anion gap. This is the type you have in hyperchloremia, where you lose bicarbonate. And when you have metabolic acidosis of this, it can either be hypokalemic or hyperkalemic. And that's where the confusion will start coming in now. So, follow me. When you have metabolic acidosis with the elevated uh, aging, this is when you have an increased production of organic acids. For example, lactic acid. Or when you have a reduced excretion of non volatile acids, reduced excretion will retain, meaning a lot of acid is still being retained in the body. And when you are producing too much of acid in the body, you are creating that situation. And that would be a situation where you have elevated anion gap. What are the things that can cause metabolic acidosis? We divide them into normal, 
and elevated. If you have hypokalemia, and conditions that can cause hypokalemia will include diarrhea. People who have diarrhea, that's pronounced, they have hypokalemia. Know that as a truth. Caponic and hydrase inhibitors. Remember the last lecture? I thought about carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. It inhibits the combination of water and carbon dioxide, and uh, there's one in the luminous side, there's one in the inside the cell. Does not allow hydrogen ion. I may mean, have drew something like that, whereby carbonate and all that is not being excreted in the body. So, carbonic and hydrase inhibitors can also cause hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. And there's what you call RTA, RTA renal tubular acidosis. That is when the tubules of the kidney, renal tubules, when it has too much of hydrogen ion being secreted, then you have acidosis. In terms of hyperkalemia, it would be hypoaldosteronism. And I know you know that aldosterone, what aldosterone does? Hmm? What does aldosterone do now, somebody? In terms of potassium. Does it cause an increase in potassium excretion or reduced potassium excretion? Reduced aldosterone now. It's one of those facts you should be able to know straight off like that. Aldosterone does something to potassium. Mm -hmm. Think, 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 think. It has to do with potassium. So it's not a question of is it potassium excretion increasing under the influence of aldosterone or potassium excretion reducing. You should be able to figure it out if you know that we are talking of hyperkalemia and hypoaldosteronism. So it should decrease. It should decrease. Aldosterone decreases potassium excretion. It decreases potassium excretion. So if you have too much of it, that means aldosterone is not secreted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hyperkalemia can also be caused by hydrochloric acid. And when you have give potassium sparing diuretics, you know the meaning of potassium sparing diuretics is they allow the body to keep potassium. So when you are keeping potassium, then you are causing hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. So aldosterone, if the amount is not enough, the body is keeping the potassium instead of excreting it. So what aldosterone does is to cause potassium increase in potassium excretion. <laughs> Know that as a rule, aldosterone causes potassium excretion. Okay, all right. So that those are the causes of metabolic acidosis. Uh, I won't finish if I'm not clear carefully. Okay, so when you have this is a summary slide. I just did this, but you, you won't find it in any textbook. I just use this to summarize all that we'll be talking about. I know there are some of you that. You're not ready for all this explanation. Just give me straight to the point. So, if you are one of those students, like me too, when you have metabolic acidosis, if it's normal, it's caused by bicarbonate loss. That is normal AG. If it's elevated AG, it's caused by increased production of this and that. This is the same information I've just given you. It can be hypokalemic or hyperkalemic. These are the things that can cause it. And you know what, of course, you know what AC inhibitors and or apps do to aldosterone? No. Okay. Now, when you have the elevated one, ARF, one thing we, uh, we mentioned in last week, ARF is metabolic acidosis, right? Mm -hmm. You know that. When you have hypoxia, hypoxia is what allows lactic acid to build up in the body. That's why you have lactic acid acidosis. 
When you have diabetes mellitus, there is ketoacidosis. Starvation can cause the same thing. Alcohol abuse can cause the same thing. And if you remember this case, the individual had alcohol issue, alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. Alcohol abuse, metabolic acidosis. Okay, and then let me go to other drugs that can cause acidosis, salicylate, because that's acetyl salicylic acid, right? Then you have things like methanol or ethylene glycol. All those will cause acidosis. This is a summary slide. So if I go to the uh, this one, all of these that I've mentioned here are on that slide. How do you manage acidosis? Because there's a deficit in bicarbonate, you should give alkaline as a replacement. Not enough bicarbonate, give alkaline. How do you give the uh, alkaline? You give sodium bicarbonate. And this can be given as tablets or what you call Scholl's solution. And Scholl's solution is the combination of citric acid and sodium citrate. When you give it in this way, the sodium citrate gets converted to the bicarbonate. Then we mentioned through metamine acetate when I treated ARF. You still remember that? Mm -hmm. Through metamine, it's an organic amine. Mm -hmm. And TAM, it's an alternative to sodium bicarbonate. And when you have hypokalemia, you should treat it with potassium supplementation. You can use potassium chloride, potassium bicarbonate, or acetate. And if there's any offending agent like lead, you remove the lead. If there's alcohol, especially if the individuals, there are those who are not satisfied with ethanol, they must take methanol, mm. because that gives them what they want. They can end up with intoxication. How do you treat that one? You treat it with ethanol and formipizole. And what happens in this case, is when an individual takes methanol, you need lactic acid dehydrogenase to convert this to formic acid. So when there's a problem with somebody that's abusing methanol, it's because too much of formic acid is floating in the system. So if you now give the individual uh, ethanol or formipizole, this is also called antazole, they compete with this. But they have greater affinity for this. And so they are able to rescue the methanol from being converted to formic acid and drive the reaction to something else. So the ethanol has higher affinity for the lactic dehydrogenase, and therefore it reduces the amount of methanol that remains in the body. Let me go to metabolic alkalosis. This is when you have an increase in serum bicarbonate and a compensatory increase in this. And this is when you have hypoventilation. When you have hypoventilation, you're not excreting as much carbon dioxide. You end up with too much of bicarbonate. There are two types. And you can base on volume status, the blood, the blood pressure, and urinary chloride content. You have cellular responsive or cellular resistant. The cellular responsive one is when you have chloride rich uh, fluid from the body. Where do you think you will get chloride rich fluid from the body? Let me just help you because of time. The stomach, there's a lot of. Yes, there's hydrochloric acid in it. So when you have individuals that vomit, they vomit a lot of the acid. Mm -hmm. That's when you mean chloride-rich fluid. That's gastric fluid. And if it's rich in uh, chloride, it cannot be rich in bicarbonate. It, uh, so that's why you say it is uh, chloride-rich fluid or bicarbonate poor fluid from the body. So in vomition, you got that. When you give diuretics, and you excrete a lot of the chlorine, and don't forget the transport mechanism that, uh, that 
uh, works in the loop of envy, sodium potassium chloride transporter. So you can lose a lot of chloride through that transport mechanism. And there are, of course, cystic fibrosis. What are the clinical signs you will see in this alkalosis? A reduction in blood pressure, the first thing, hypotension, the heart rate will be low, the skin will be almost like that of an elephant, very, you will lose a lot of elasticity. And then if you do the lab, you find that, that the concentration of uh, chloride is less than this value because a lot of the chloride has been lost from the body through formation. Then you have the cellular resistant form. This is rare, and you get this when you have severe hypokalemia or when you have excessive mineral corticoid activity. And the excessive mineral corticoid activity in this case will be excessive aldosterone. And when there's too much of aldosterone, then you get too much of sodium and water retention, and that's where you get an increase in blood pressure. Now, what's the treatment for this? Remove the cause. If they are di diuretics, remove the cause. Replace chloride and potassium levels with sodium chloride and this. The amount you give should be sufficient to just correct it. Be wary of uh, being given overdose. If patients are unresponsive to sodium chloride and this, then you treat with acetazolamide, which is a carbonic and hydrous inhibitor. You treat with hydrochloric acid too, because this is acid and we're talking of uh, Alkalosis. Or you can all give their precursors like ammonium and arginine hydrochloride. And here I've just reminded you what acetazolamide does. It blocks hydrogen uh, secretion, which allows you to excrete sodium and bicarbonate. If you refer, uh, when you are reviewing what I told you on the um, carbonic and hydrous inhibitors in diuretics, you will remember that. So let's talk about respiratory acidosis. In this case, there's inadequate ventilation. And when the ventilation is inadequate, the excretion of carbon dioxide will be poor, which means the arterial, when the carbon dioxide is not being excreted, then the arterial, it builds up in the system, and then the arterial pressure of carbon dioxide in the system is high. And that's what leads to a reduction in pH. What can cause respiratory acidosis? If there's airway obstruction, like in asthma, or when there's a reduction in stimulus for respiration from the CNS, or when there's heart and lung failure, or when there are disorders of peripheral nerves or skeletal muscles. How do you treat respiratory acidosis? Correct the underlying cause. If there is airway obstruction, you give bronchodilators. A good and bronchodilator would be anticholinergic. You can also give adrenergic agents like albuterol, which is one of the standard things you use for asthma. You can also give corticosteroids. And when there's infection, you've got to give beta lactam antibiotics for the infection. Forget about this one. Then let me go to respiratory alkalosis. What are the common causes of respiratory alkalosis? You have CNS disturbances, I've listed those ones. You can have drugs. You can have uh, pulmonary issues, pneumonia, pulmonary edema. You can have tissue hypoxia. When you have tissue hypoxia, especially those who live in high altitude, you know, they always complain of hypoxia. When there's hypotension, when there's a congestive heart failure, all of these can cause alkalosis. And as the next slide shows, respiratory alkalosis is not a severe disorder. And it results from <coughs> increase in respiratory drive. It can result from pneumonia and pulmonary disease. And how does it present? There will be paresthesia of the extremities and the perioral regions, you know, extreme sensitive, uh, sensitivity there. There will be lightheadedness. There'll be confusion, there'll be mental act, uh, activities, there'll be uh, 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 tachycardia, and there will be an increase in respiratory rate. None of these, anyway, is life threatening. How do you treat respiratory alkalosis? You just correct for any of the underlying causes. 
Then there's this conservative treatment, which is you tell the individuals to rebreathe expired air from a paper bag. Mm -hmm. And what that does is the oxygen, the carbon dioxide that's being expelled, the person is rebreathing it. So the closed bag, closed paper bag, this is a well known remedy for treating hyperventilation and the anxiety that is associated with it. So, the, what you have here is just a summary of the treatment that I've just mentioned now. The case here, I just want to quickly say this, that when you're talking about fluid and electrolyte uh, disorder, okay, let me use five minutes to do this. It's a relation it's in relation to body fluid and body water. And these values that I've given you here, you should be able to relate to them. But you do know that in the intracellular compartment, the major anion is potassium. That one you know a long time ago. But you also have magnesium and phosphate. Whereas in the extracellular compartment, you have sodium, the chloride, and the bicarbonate. And that's why when you are measuring uh, arterial blockers. Those are the ones that are easily measured. I measured volume regulators. That's what I started the lectures on the arena system with. So you can go back there, ADH, the suppressing, uh, angiotensin, and natural uretic peptides, and all that. When you have sodium, flu uh, sodium volume depletion, uh, depletion, that's when there's fluid loss either through permission or through diarrhea, or the individual is not taking enough sodium. What are the signs you find? There will be autostatic hypotension. The pulse will be increased, the person will feel dizzy, and the mucous membranes will be dry. Then you can have metabolic alkalosis in this individual because of the formation, and due to volume depletion and the uh, increase in renal bicarbonate reabsorption. To treat this, we just administer sodium chloride. I've talked about nephrotic syndrome. Whatever you have there is what I've shared with you before. In terms of treatment, I've shared the same thing with you because of time, I'm not going to go over there. But I want to talk to you about water intoxication. And you will read the number of cases that I showed you to know that water itself has as neutral and as useful as it is, it can cause a fatal disturbance in brain function. And when you use too much water, there are those ones who take too much water. The problem is they think they're cleaning the system, but uh, they end up with hypothyroidism. And I'll tell you what will happen. If you take too much water, how many of these have you taken this one? Yes. You haven't taken it. Uh, my friend, have. That's the second one, or the third one, this one? This is the first one. That's the first one, okay. <laughs> Go slow on it. Okay, she's taking her own now. Okay, we have the big jar of essential behind you. Hmm? Okay, all right now. Uh, people have to watch out for aquanine uh, treatment. There's this belief that you are cleaning the system, you're cleaning the kidney. When you go to the bathroom and your urine is not in yellow, then you know you are drinking too much water. Your urine occasionally go to the bathroom, look at the color of your urine. If it does not change the amount of water there, throw the rest of the bottle for the day. You don't need it. So if it's white, hmm? if it's white, that means you're done. If you're white, I will show you what happens now. <laughs> so. That's overconsumption of water. You are overhydrating yourself and you are ending up with hypothyroidism. And I'll show you what's happening. So, water is the least toxic chemical compound we know in this world. But you take too much of it, you end up with water intoxication. So, what are the risk factors for water intoxication? Low body mass. If you give too much water to infants, you can easily overhydrate them. In endurance sports, marathon runners, you can overdo it. 
If you over exert yourself and you have heat uh, distress, you can do that. There are those who also have abused ecstasy. Ecstasy is associated with their hyponatremia. Then it's okay. So those who have psychiatric conditions, like you have uh, polydipsy, they get thirsty so fast, and they drink a lot, and they pee a lot, that one can cause water intoxication. And then if you feed uh, parental solutions to unconscious person, too much of it can also do that. So the cases I've mentioned here are the cases of those ones who died because of too much water. As a case here, somebody that's pledging for the fraternity, they consume vast amounts of alcohol over a 10 day initiation and hazing process. And the last, on the last night of the pledge, he had to drink gallons of water through a funnel. What happens when you have hyponatremia is that there's not enough sodium in the body, and so the body just starts sweating. And when the brain sweats, it's a terrible thing. So this guy died from brain swelling because of that. Another case of uh, fraternity uh, hazing that caused that I've uh, give you, giving you that, that uh, example too, you can look at it. This other woman, a British woman, she died after drinking four liters of water under two hours because she was trying to do a lighter diet plan. Be careful about your diet. <laughs> okay? So what happens when you have hyponatremia? This is where you now got to listen. That giving too much, you're taking too much water for the ability of the kidney to excrete the free water. Okay, and you can have three types. There's the edematous one, in which case, edema. There's a volume overload. That's why you call it hypervolemic. What happens in terms of three elements? We look at so, uh, total body sodium, total body water, and yes, when you look at those two, in edematous type, there's an increase in both total body water and total body sodium. You see this in cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is one of the conditions to cover. CHF is one of the conditions that covered earlier on. Nephrotic syndrome are covered also that one. All of these belong to the edematous body overload. In the non-edematous hypovolemic one, you lose total body sodium and you lose total body water. And where do you find this? You lose a GI fluid in Addison's disease in osmotic diuresis. Then you have the other type, which is non-edematous, non-bolemic, uh, non where you lose both total so body sodium and total body water. And when do you see these cases? When you have an inappropriate vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone uh, production. If you remember SIRDH in our last lecture when I talked about uh, vasopressin. Mm -hmm. When there's too much of uh, ADH, then you got too much of water inside the cell system because the antidiuretic hormone effect is too great. And because of all this, all of this will be hypotonic because it's not enough uh, electrolyte in the amount of water in the body. What can happen, like you see in some of the cases, there are neuro neurologic manifestations, cerebral edema, you can have nausea, vomition, just general sickness. You can have headache, tremor, delirium, lethargy, obtundation. You can, you can progress to seizure or coma when there is too much. How do you manage this? Throw away the water. Mm. If, we just, if that fails, then we've got to give drugs that can antagonize the effects of ADH. So if you refer to, to be back, uh, uh, the V2 receptor antagonists that I mentioned in the last class, mm -hmm. then, and uh, of course I mentioned the meclostaclin as one of the anti ADH drugs. Then those basal pressing antagonists mm -hmm. would be useful in overcoming the effect of too much of ADH. So, what I'll do is the rest of this particular lecture, which is hyponatremia and hypokalemia, I will include it in. The recording I'll make. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions? Will there be a quiz on Sunday? Would there be? A quiz on Sunday.
Yeah, there will be a quiz on Sunday. Yeah, you get 15 questions for me. Uh -huh. Oh, no, I won't do that to you. Yeah. No, I, I won't bother you with the, with the ranges of the sodium chrome uh, content. That would be too much.